approach the problem. Okay, everyone, thank you for being here. We are, um, um, uh, this is the November um, psychology uh, colloquium. And we are very uh, proud uh, to have someone that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, Dr. Rafa Linera is a senior scientist at John Hopkins University um, in the Applied Physics Laboratory. And he comes to the Applied Physics Laboratory after 27 years of active duty, <laughs> military service in the Army. His experience includes working with conventional forces. Um, uh, hold on a second, I'm allowing people in. So his experience uh, includes um, working with, uh, let's see, conventional forces. And um, let me see, uh, all right. Uh, conventional forces, special operations, interagency, multinational partners with deployments and overseas assignments uh, to Korea, Iraq, Mexico, Ecuador, and Afghanistan. He holds a doctorate and master's in psychology from Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara. Um, and his research and academic <coughs> work uh, includes strategy development, policy making, social media campaign simulations, measures of effectiveness, and media psychology. And this is um, a coming home of sorts, as you just heard Karen, um, you know, uh, speaking with uh, Rafa, uh, because clearly Rafa was a major part of our lives when, when he was here in uh, the program. And we all agree that we love this title, Rafa, which is how to get from chaotic to simple situation through the use of design methodology. And I can tell you that I was there for the chaos. Uh, it was uh, Dan Sewell and myself, Dan as methodologist, and, um, and sort of the chaos of when Rafa uh, was here. Um, just one more note, um, Brian uh, had an emergency, so I, uh, that's why I'm sitting in for him uh, and uh, co-hosting. Uh, however, um, he might be able to join us um, if he gets back in time. So at this point, Rafa, I turn it over to you. And I would ask that all of us uh, mute ourselves as uh, Rafa is speaking, and then we will have ample time to ask questions, send your questions in the chat, or uh, just go ahead and, and have your conversation with Rafa. So Rafa, my friend, take it. Back to the old times. There you go. So, yeah. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, hopefully you will not regret it. Uh, but something that is kind of funny is that here I have Karen, which was the one who got me into fielding, right? So she was the one that interviewed me, and we can talk about that later, maybe on a bar or something like that. Um, but Regina was the one who got me out of fielding back in 2016. Of course, she was uh, my chair and uh, mentor with regards to, you know, the journey as uh, as a student going through uh, the comps to the actual dissertation. So thank you both for that. I appreciate it. And everyone else that is coming here to hear me. So with that said, let me go hit the next slide. So with regards to the agenda, so I have, um, I'm going to be discussing the Kinevin framework and design methodology. This, these are the references you, you can, you know, get your smartphones and, and check on them. This one is a, a YouTube video that talks about the Kinevin framework. And these two references are um, what we do in, in the Department of Defense. Uh, I want to say we, when I was in the Department of Defense in the Army, uh, what I used to do with regards to design methodology. This one here is the Army uh, design methodology, and this one is uh, the operational design, which is a joint level in which you have Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, Air Force, and all that. Okay, uh, but you're gonna see that they're pretty much uh, one of the same, right? And why am I telling you all that? Well, at least in my career, they have told me, hey, I want you to measure X, Y, and Z. Like for instance, measure the impact of this tweet that we're sending out, right? So I'm like, okay, so how can I put that in a way that I can manage you know, the expectation as far as measuring impact 
from a message, from a theme, from a narrative, you know what I'm saying? And in what situation? So I usually talk to, you know, whoever I'm doing this for, say, okay, you know what, are we measuring a drop? Are we measuring the lake, right? In which that drop eventually is gonna go to, right? Or are we measuring the drop that's gonna go on the lake during a storm, right? And a way that um, has helped me throughout the years is the uh, Kinevin framework in which it helps me understand what quadrants am I in? For instance, in simple, you know, aspects, you know, measuring a drop, you know, could be very simple. You know, it could be in a lab environment. It could be in a contained environment, right? And this is where we have, you know, the best practices. You know, everything is laid out. Everything is controlled. All the variables are there and they're very known. But then you have, you know, the complicated aspect, right? In which that may be, measuring that lake, right? In which you can get different people with different subject matter expertise, right? In which they can bring their own best practices, but overall is gonna be kind of a good practice. Why? Because it's, it's complicated. You have different forms in here. You know, you have, you know, the, the top of the leg, you had the middle of the leg, you had the deep of the leg, you have the shores and all that, right? But then you have, you know, the complex aspect in which, you know, that case, now I need to, make sure that not only I measure that lake, but also measure the drop in the lake and the impact that that leaves in the lake. And that's more kind of the complex quadrant. But then you have, of course, when it's a, a mess, right? When there's a crisis going on and now you have to measure your input with the environment that you don't even know uh, what it is, right? So. These at least help me out on how to classify uh, the impact of my operations in a specific setting, right? So why am I telling you all this? Well, sometimes when they tell me to, hey, measure impact, measure, you know, effectiveness of our campaigns, right? Sometimes they forget uh, to tell me their objectives, right? Their, the way that they want to uh, achieve certain things, right? And what I tell them, hey, it's like, hey, give me what's the current situation, or at least allow me to define that current situation in order to make sure that we're good to go with regards to what you want to achieve. And then I can come up with an operational approach or an approach that will then bridge that uh, thing between where we are at to uh, the end state, right? And what I tell um, everyone is that, you know, that aspect in itself, it's very conceptual in which you don't go straight and do things. You actually pause, think, you define the problem, right? And that is something that is very recursive. It, it continues to happen even when we are conducting detailed planning, right? Or actually executing a plan. We need to always go back to the conceptual aspect in which, okay, I know we're executing, right? But am I executing the right things? And am I, am I measuring the right things? And am I being effective, right? And, and that way, this design methodology assists us in, in that case, not only setting the, uh, the problem, in a way that we can then divide it in different chunks, you know, like when you have an elephant, you divide it in different chunks, right? Uh, but also to, to make it more manageable and being able to um, assess where you're at before you actually go on and, and try to go, right? So, and this methodology applies, you know, to wherever you're at. In this case, you know, for me, it was the commanders. In this case, you know, you can have the leadership, um, and it's important because they need to be involved in order to provide that guidance, right? Um, where we're at and where we want to go. And then for us to come up with solutions that will bridge that gap. Okay. Um, and this is what I was saying before with regards to the conceptual aspect before we go to detail uh, planning in which we need to understand what to do and also 
the why. Why are we doing these things? And then the detailed planning, it's more with regards to how we're going to go and do those things after we get that defined and also the why, right? So you see a symbiotic relationship between, between both, basically. Okay. Um, a way that I usually tell everyone on how to come up with a uh, design framework is then again, understand what is the guidance? What do we need to accomplish, right? And then understanding the environment in which we're gonna be operating. That in itself, is gonna help us identify the problem, right? Or the gaps, similar to a lit review. That's why in fielding, they make us do a lit review. So we know what's out there before we actually come up with a potential solution or a methodology um, to then experiment, to then go back to, to see how we bridge that gap. And there's many ways to do it. And, and one of the um, things that helped me out the most in fielding was when Karen um, was uh, doing the, uh, the methods lessons, right? You know, back in the day, they were the 500, I think. And we had three uh, different courses in which was all the methodology that we had to do, right? So then again, the importance of knowing the guidance, right? From your bosses, from what, what you want to do, understanding where you're at, that delta, that difference will help you to find the problem for them, for you to come up with an approach that will then help solving the situation and help you uh, with regards to a detail, more, you know, to more tuned in uh, planning aspect, right? So then again, this design methodology in which you have the current state, the desired state, help you frame the problem, then for you to come up with an operational approach to then start going with a detail planning, okay? And with that said, I would like to open it up for any questions. So um, thank you, Rafa. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I actually have a question that, you know, always comes up when we are asking uh, research questions, right? And we want to study something. So there are situations where um, it really is a defined paradigmatic situation, right? Um, and sort of you have means ends, right? So if I want to accomplish X, if I want to go to the library, I need to take a left here. I can design my method of going there. And depending on, do I need to save gas? Do I need to, you know, do I want efficiency of time spent driving? Things like that, right? So those are pretty well defined end goals. But oftentimes as researchers, and, and I'm gonna give you the example. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say that I am, I don't know, uh, doing research on, you know, uh, looking at, I don't know, unconscious processes, uh, the old Banaji and Greenwald paradigm. They give me a way of going in there and studying unconscious processes, but I wanna bring in, you know, for example, you know, not a lot of work has been done. I'm making this up on transgender, for example. So I want to apply this research to now a transgender population or have, let's say, how people react to transgender population. Here's the thing. That's pretty defined as a research question because uh, I can really take their methodology and now I can say, okay, I already said here what my lit review is because it hasn't been applied in this population. Here's what we have, but we're adding, I want to look at this population. So um, in that case, it's pretty straightforward and, and, and this can help me. But can you speak a little bit about when it's not as defined, when I don't have a methodology to guide me, when it's not clear cut what I want to do? Right. And I, I remember your own dissertation, which was so chaotic because we were really in uncharted territory. So I wonder how you would apply this method to that. Right. So I'm going to go to one of my hidden slides. Um, 
actually, you know what? I don't have it, but basically there's a um, way that I would go after it. It's And it's, let me share this one um, right here. So the aspect of being in the chaotic, right? You need to understand first where you at, right? And at that point of time, we knew that we were in the chaotic, right? So we had ways to go back to at least in the complex or complicated by having different um, theories or different approaches, right? To then piecemeal out the complexities of that situation. For instance, um, in our dissertation, I was trying to assess fear or impact with regards to terrorist attacks leading up to, in that case, the Sochi Olympics, right? And, and that one has been studied in the past, you know, the study of fear and how it changes people, you know, behaviors and perceptions and attitudes and all that. It's, you know, Cantrell, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that was one of your ratings, right? Um, and also utilizing theories, uh, practical theories, such as uh, social representation theory, and which would at least give you a lead uh, with regards to how people uh, do common sense or think about common sense in which you have anchoring and object objectification, right? Or minority influence, majority or minority influence, right? So looking at those different um, practical theories, semiotics as well too, right? You, you can actually apply those theories in certain aspects of the phenomenon that you're investigating in order to at least make sense out of it and come out with new knowledge. Going back to the example with the dissertation, um, so the um, Sochi Olympics was in February 2014 and it lasted until maybe March time frame right uh, but before that there was a uprising with regards to um you know locals against putin uh that they didn't want to have the olympics there in sochi so what they did is that they, they had a terrorist attack and then leading up to the beginning of the sochi olympics they then disseminated hey we did it you know they they claimed um you know, that they did the attacks, right? So you have two messages right there. One is the message zero, that was the explosion that perhaps did not get that much traction. But then you have, hey, I did it. And now all of a sudden leading up to the Olympics, it goes with the wave of, of the level of information since it's attached and anchored to an Olympic event, which right. is a and, massive and, event. Yeah, and just to be clear for everyone here, it was truly chaotic uh, because just for context, um, this terrorist group put out a video and they said, we did it, right? And what made Rafa's uh, research question so new, novel and chaotic for all of us, I mean, I really relate to that picture you have there with chaos, is that then he wanted to see what happened as this message was disseminated across, this is the issue, across different media platforms. So, and, and so, you know, what he did was, you know, now we had the issue of, okay, well, you've got this, you know, but then what happens as the message spreads out uh, and, and through these different mediums and platforms, um, and, and it's interesting because, and this is the chaos, this is the, the sort of, I think where Rafa is mentioning the, 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 the research, the, the lit review, right? And in our case, uh, we had, um, funny enough, we had some current approaches that could apply, but there were earlier approaches in social psychology that could really anchor and give him a guide to how to approach this because some researchers had, earlier researchers 
had studied this kind of thing. Like what happens when a message is disseminated? I mean, there's a there's a clear example of, uh, uh, we didn't refer to this one so much, Rafa, but there was a one where, you know, Milgram actually mailed a postcard. God bless Milgram. You know, uh, we have so much to, to draw on from him. And so he wanted to find out, you know, the chain, like where would it go? Who would ask someone to mail it? And then who would, right? So he was keeping track of that. But we also had studies like, and he mentioned Cantrell uh, in the psychology of fear. Um, and so what happens when there's a fear uh, message? But then we also had like this uh, amazing study done earlier on that nobody, if we go by the APA, we wouldn't be able to use it because it's old, but essentially it was uh, Bartlett. And what happens when you take a message and you give it to different people and then how is that changed? And Rafa ultimately came up with, you know, approach social representations because social representations and is basically about what happens. It's about thoughts in the making and thoughts in transition. So that, that's kind of the context for a lot of what Rafa is saying. So Rafa, uh, I don't know uh, if you want to pick up on that. No, no, that helps. And, and then again, those early theories, right, helped us to make sense of what was happening right now in a complicated, actually, it was in a chaotic environment as it was happening in real time. And I remember when it happened, I was, uh, John Pierre was my, uh, my mentor at that point of time, my advisor, right? And uh, he goes, Rob, and we were at winter session when it was happening. I didn't sleep all throughout that week because I went and grabbed everything as it was happening to then try to make sense later as I was um, getting into the new courses that Fielding was providing. And one of the, those were the courses that Regina had and also uh, Karen had. Um, and also our late beloved, you know, uh, Jason Oller, you know, as far as, you know, the medium is the message since he was a protege from McLellan. You know, so so then again, and, and what I was told was that if you have the data and if you collect the data, in that case, if you know how to collect it, and in that case, we were taught how to do that, you're king, because then you can go back and apply these research methodologies uh, to those spe specific things that perhaps may not be there later, okay? And this quadrant, at least, you know, the, the Kinevin framework has helped me out understanding where I'm at, because usually I'm in the middle, right? I'm trying to see where I'm at. Uh, because if I think, oh yeah, I have those earlier theories that are going to help me, there's a cliff here, an imaginary cliff that I can fall into chaotic and I don't even know it. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, right? Um, be here in the middle, help, help me out, not only as an academic practitioner, but also in the military. And now at uh, where I'm at, uh, to 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 see where I'm at and where do I need to go utilizing the sign methodology. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Karen. Uh, Karen, yeah, go. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a little tip that I just realized if I said to students might help. <laughs> I love when that happens. Angel told me it helped her, so now she's created a monster. So um, what, I, what I see happening, and I'm sure Regina has seen this as well um, in people's dissertations sometimes, is that they're clear about the, the general landscape that they're living in, right? They know what, like what Rafa just uh, um, explained, um, the, it's sort of the chaos. Um, but what they don't know, and this is my tip, is that uh, a research paper, an empirical article, is a lot about the variables you choose. So my tip is, think about what the variables are, because there's a big temptation to just spread out like so many stars in the sky to all the things that are related in this cloud of, of you know, all these stars in the sky. But um, uh, here's where I'm going to switch my metaphors. You can only uh, take a couple of people to the prom. Like <laughs> You can only take a couple of variables with you. You can only have like, you know, you can't just date everyone is what I'm saying. I mean, uh, some people do, I suppose. But you, you can't just like have a whole party with 30 people at it or 30 dates at it or something. You're going to have to narrow it down. There's going to be like two independent variables and two dependent variables or something. It's small. And so you, you can't jump from thing to thing to thing in the starry sky that are all related to this. You've got to decide who are you taking with you. I need to, I, you guys need to help me with my metaphors here, but it's like a small group. 
like a couple of independent variables, a couple of dependent variables. And the theory and stuff, that's the that's the why you're choosing them. But as an example, um, so Josh Cohen, one of my students now, is really interested in the concept of re-watching. So like the idea that we could watch something new, a television or movie, what have you, uh, or we could re-watch things. And I think most of us do a little bit of each. But uh, then you go to the literature, you say, okay, re-watching, that can get into this whole stars in the sky, like binge watching, um, streaming, uh, you know, genres of media, stories, transportation, identification, parasocial, celebrities. Now, there's all these things that are like hovering around this. So what do you do? So we were, we are working with Melanie Green and she did a paper on rereading. So what are the personality correlates of people who reread? I, I almost never reread anything. I read, read all the Harry Potters right before I see the, the new film or <laughs> something like that, but I don't generally reread anything. Um, fiction that I'm talking about. Um, but my husband rereads all the time. <clears throat> and so this is just an, an entryway to, to variables. So um, some people like to reread. And what Melanie found about rereading was that it was more introverted people like to reread. And there was other things, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. But then we ask ourselves, okay, is rewatching like that? Because sadly, if you look at the stats, people, adults in America read like less than an hour a day, but we watch tons of media. So uh, we watch more than we read. And uh, Josh had told me that The Office is the most streamed um, television show ever. And then then anyway, we, we ended up doing a study, but the question would be, what are we gonna measure? So I'll tell you just one thing. Um, we measured something called nostalgia proneness. And so re-watching or re-reading, that has an element of familiarity in it. You've seen it, are you gonna see it again? Are you gonna watch it again? Let's watch our favorite episode of The Office tonight. Um, so the familiarity effect is just, if, you, if something is neutral to positive, the more you see it generally, the more you like it. And so, and then nostalgia is to me relevant to that because you enjoy something because you've seen it many times. You, like I am a huge Scooby-Doo fan. I actually dressed up as Velma this Halloween <laughs> and who's just like me. Um, and so uh, it's the idea that, oh, I've had Scooby-Doo with me all my life. I love Scooby-Doo. I've seen those characters. I see the dolls in the store. You know, it's this multiple exposures, uh, familiarity. It's comfortable. So for example, during the pandemic, we were asking people, did you rewatch? And one of the things we wanted to know was, is one of the motives for that um, nostalgia or familiarity that we were in an uncomfortable situation, so we want to go to something comfortable. I had a friend, this is just one of those things that happens in life that sparks your research interests. My friend says to me early in the pandemic, I am just not watching anything that I don't know the end of right now. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. She said, I just, I don't need any more shocks, right? Like in the early days, we all remember how it was. It was not good. She, she didn't want an open-ended, potentially disastrous, shocking situation. She wanted something she knew the end of. So it's things like that of, okay, this, this study is only so big. It can't be everything. You can't jump from one thing to the other. So which variables, which, which people at your party, guests at your dinner, however you want to look at it, are you going to choose? And again, I'm taking it from the methods perspective. You could take it from the theory perspective. It's an iterative process. You're going to go back to the literature, to the theories, back to the studies that have been done, the methods and the data. And hopefully over time, something will gel. But I think it'll gel more if you realize what you're doing is trying to decide what factors to study, even with, even with a um, qualitative study. Like right now, we're interviewing people about the office again. Um, but we have to have the centralizing question of uh, what we're asking them about is their feelings about romantic relationships in the office. We want to know, do are they made uncomfortable by the actor's real life romantic relationship because they are familiar with the relationship in the show? So you have to decide what is it? Okay, I know I know what the sky looks like. I like the sky. I'm choosing this area of the sky but I can't choose all the stars. So which, which stars am I gonna choose for my study? That's my two cents worth, Angel, it's all your fault. Thank you.
you, Karen. Um, Thanks, Karen. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have another question, but I, I want to hear from everybody else first. Students, colleagues, uh, friends of fielding here, uh, our graduates. Um, if you have any questions for Rafa and anything that you've heard today, you can chime in or type your question. I had a question, hold on. I'm moving my screen over. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Irma. Um, so I think majority of you guys already know that like the little boat that I'm in, uh, my desire to, and I'm, I'm first semester, first year, so I know, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm very careful about that. And I'm also very aware of not letting passion become combative. But I want to focus my dissertation on inclusion in storytelling. And what I am like really kind of enjoying learning now is understanding like how can things be measured. But what I am struggling with is the lake of just like there is one drop but I am drowning in many because like you can go in so many which way of directions. And I don't, it's not, I think it's, it's, I hate the saying of like, you don't know what you don't know, but like, I'm also kind of in that boat too, where it's like, how many theories could I make myself aware of before I get to a place where I'm strong enough for dissertation or how many books should I like, you know dive into or whatever that kind of thing so yeah that that's kind of where I'm at so like I guess my question is is like what is your advice for someone like I know I want to get to that hill I just don't know how to get there so uh, my experience literally it's just to express that same concern to your advisor and the reason why I'm telling you that is because um John Pierre when he was at my advisor, I was giving him exactly the same problem and he was leading me into, oh, you need to take this class. And then when Jason became my advisor, he did the same thing. And then when Regina told me, hey, you need to get out of the media and go now on the hardcore uh, cognitive, you know, behavioral stuff that they do on, on, the, on the psychology one, not on the media one, but some of those uh, key ones foundational you know actually that kind of hit me uh, and, and not to say that we don't have a, a phenomenal curriculum we do but what I was looking for she was telling me hey you need to take this class outside of of our curriculum you know what I'm saying which of course it's now it's going to be an elective for you um, um, Geraldine did the same thing uh, with regards to like, hey, you need to take some master's classes as well too that we provide in the master's uh, you know, program that we were able to use, uh, that I was able to take when I was in the PhD program, which was amazing, I'm telling you. So long story short, I think your, your advisor is gonna be the best person who tell you, um, where, you, where, you where you can go and then you select the journey and then you go back to, your advisor say, hey, you were right or you were wrong. You know, I'm kidding. Uh, usually they're not wrong. Sometimes we take routes that we're not supposed to take like I did. And, and, but you know what? That's a learning process. You know what I'm saying? And, and the beauty about fielding, it's, it's that you are within that sandbox, right? Um, and, and, and within that sandbox, you have, you know, players in there that can help you, you know, build your castle you know what i'm saying but then when you go through dissertation no kidding that's where you're going to be the, the castle for real uh, but it's still within that sandbox it's just that it's going to be harder it's going to have more structure right then for you to take that to the real world and you know have at it you know what i'm saying and going back to what uh karen mentioned that sometimes us as students we like to to do everything you know what i'm saying and that can hinder your progress because you need to focus on one or two variables, like she said, right? Uh, something representative for the phenomenon that you're studying. And you know what? Go from there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, because this is a learning experience that yes, will get you those three letters, that PhD, 
but it's only the beginning, right? That's what's going to set you up for later when you get funding to do all what you want, you know, conquer the world and, and do big things, right? So I would say expectation management, talk to your advisor. They'll tell you where to go. And nine times out of 10 is not 10 times out of 10. They are totally right. So those are my thoughts. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, can, I, can you see me now? I have um, something to add to that um, because I've been interested in like positive bias change and attitude change all along. Like how can we help be anti-racist, for example, or whatever, fight propaganda. So what I've been doing is, well, what I did all along, I'm just now in my dissertation is um, in each one of the classes that I took, and I took a really wide range of classes so that I could have exposure to as many theories as possible. But I focused in on um, those areas where um, it would be promoting, you know, bias change or what have you, you know, within each one of my classes and each one of the papers that I did all along and applying those to all the different types of media because there's storytelling involved in everything. So it's, that's a huge area. And I was initially interested in doing like a side-by-side -side virtual reality 2D normal display, like soup to nuts, persuasive model of narrative transportation engagement. But then I ran into a wall because character identification is like huge, it turns out in all of this and very difficult to measure. So I'm doing my dissertation on just character identification and how that's been used in all these different studies within stories, you know? So I think there's some of that that will become evident to you as you start to run into, oh, this is where the research is now in this subject. You know what I mean? So that's my two cents. Um, and I guess for, for Rafa, um, I'm curious which uh, additional classes or um, what have you really skills really made the difference. Um, and I'm also interested in like, learning some advanced computing things myself. So I didn't know if you had any particular um, tools that you would like to share. Right, so back in the day, we had uh, Leximancer, um, which uh, started, I think it was in 2012, 2013. Um, one of the books that they developed that time, there was a chapter from the person who actually brought Leximancer uh, to fielding. Um, great story, very moving story. Uh, he mm -hmm. actually published that. Karen was helping him. Uh, he passed away. Uh, so, but I'm telling you, his legacy still continues. Um, so, Leximancer is a a uh, one of the tools. I think we do SPSS as well too, um, with regards to analyzing uh, quantitative data. Um, so, those at least were the two that you know Fielding had at that point of time. So. Can I, can I yeah, jump in here? Uh, Holly, we have a new concentration in social media research methods, uh, which is something that I have always been dreaming of. <laughs> um, there's actually gonna be a webinar on it for, uh, in, for prospective students. Um, uh, I think tomorrow I'm doing that, but we finally have a social media research concentration. And in addition to the research methods that we have here at Fielding, uh, students will be able to take that. These are very uh, applied skills that not only will help you as an academic research, but you could leverage that in the workplace when you know both types, the more traditional quantitative, qualitative approaches, but also having the skills with these tools, um, highly employable, right? Uh, so we will, uh, and that will be the students who follow that curriculum, uh, we'll get that as part of their transcript so that it shows that you took these courses uh, as part of the, like any other certificate that we do at Fielding. Uh, so part of that will be introduction to lots of software that will allow students to do research and ask questions if you want to um, essentially 
you know, go into social media data. And, and this will be both quantitative and qualitative and showing you the limitations of, you know, once we take research methods, transpose that onto social media, uh, you know, what can we bring and what do we lose? Because clearly we don't have as much control over the data if you're looking for quantitative. So just want to say that. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm going to have to take that class just because it's so exciting. <laughs> it's actually more than one class. Uh, it's it's going. I think it's a sequence right now of three classes and then uh, a kind of commitment to do some kind of research or use this methodology as part of your dissertation. But we're all, you know, the first class I think will be taught next term, uh, and we are still, you know, it's brand new, so we're working on it. But that's a big plus for all of our students. Yeah, I would say something other than classes, you know, the symposiums that they do not only winter sessions, summer session, but also there are some clusters as well too. And I've gone um, in the past, you know, Regina took me to uh, Manchester, right? So, and, and we talk about things like that, you know what I'm saying? So uh, same thing with uh, Canada, you know, so there are other than, and I'm so glad the fielding is doing this right now with regards to social media concentration uh, in media, uh, but also exposing yourself to different symposiums that they do have, uh, that they're very rich in content as well too. Any other questions, comments, anything that we could help you? Coffee, tea, somebody could deliver that to you, I'm sure. Rafa will be paying though. On me. A drink perhaps, I don't know. Well, if you're in Pacific time, <laughs> too early yeah, you're not supposed to uh but we're in eastern time here oh Regina, we've got so. it coming we've got it coming um <laughs> i wanted to to make a comment and my colleagues here and students can address this and i think that one of the things that we do encounter is how do we and it's a challenge how do we develop comfort with the chaos, right? Because the chaos component can be full of emotions, anxiety, frustrations. And I wonder uh, if any of my colleagues here can address it from our own perspectives or Rafa. Uh, so if we could, and even any of our graduates here that have dealt with this issue. So how do we deal with the chaos? That point where it's not defined. Um. Then again, I would always go to the advisor and and or whoever's going to be your chair. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, and I hate to put it this way, but it's like going to the gym, right? Uh, you're going to the gym right now and you're getting the best trainers you can ever get with regards to media psychology and any other also uh, areas which also compose the media psychology faculty. Um, the curriculum is amazing, but I would say what makes the curriculum amazing, it's the instructors, I mean, the professors, but also the students bringing up their piece as we learn, you know, from the instructors, the curriculum, but also from what's out there as well, too. And uh, how do you deal with the chaos? You know what? By exposing yourself, exposing, you know, what what are your needs, your wants, your desires, your questions? Sometimes everything starts with a question. And then we go and look for certain answers that may or may not be the answer you want, but it's an answer, right? And the good thing about it is that you, you have this journey starting from uh, NSO all the way up to graduation in which you can go after that question or at least some part of that question, like uh, Karen mentioned that we may not be able to get the full question answered, but a portion um, of it, yes. And that's what's going to help you during that journey to actually pass it on to your rest of your lives, like I have been doing. I have a, an answer to the, how do you deal with the chaos? This is something I've tried to do with, with students over and over again. I do it, you know, self therapy with myself too. And here, here's what it is. Um, what do you really want to know? And then the related question, why? So like Holly and I are working uh, on her dissertation now. It's, a, it's a, one of those things where it's a research collaboration um, 
stuff that I was doing and then Holly's is taking it on. The question there is, I really wanna know how, what are the studies that have been done with character identification? Um, how have people defined identification and how have people measured identification? And what's the correspondence between those two? Why do I wanna know that? Because I have noticed there's a lot of chaos in definitions that people slip and slide between parasocial and identification. And my mentor was a was a very strong methodologist, and you know the way the way I was raised, you have to have discrete definitions of things. You have to define a term, know what it is, and how it is different from the other thing. And if you mean parasocial, you know what that is. And if you mean identification, you know what that is. And there are different types of identification, like um, affinity means you like I like Black Panther. Um, wishful identification is I want to be more like Black Panther. So you can't just say identification. So to me, and that that's my motivation for this particular research, the field, I think, needs that that paper. And I'm hoping for Holly that when we publish this paper, knock on bamboo, my desk is made out of bamboo, um, that people will go to this and use this because it's a way of putting order into a very messy field. The field is everywhere. Our definitions I, I have a paper I like to cite. It's about My Little Pony fans, and they say it's about um, identification, but they in the title, they call it parasocial identification, which, hello, is not a thing. I want you to know I was the editor who published this paper, so I'm not making fun of it. It's a good paper, and I like it, um, but I think that's just a symptom of we're all confused, and we're kind of just schmooching between the two terms, like, oh, you know what I mean, identification, parasocial. Those are different things. By the way, side note, part of it I think is when you connect to a character, it's not a it's not a one time uh, what's the word unitary uh, response. You're constantly moving. It's constantly dy dynamic, and so um, something that's parasocial could also be an identification because we're constantly moving. And I think that's confused it. But um, if you're just in the constellation and you're just thinking like, oh, you know, I want to know something about why people like certain characters. Um, I have often seen my job as chair is to help the person get back to the heart and soul of this. What is it about this general area that that made you pick it of all the fascinating things in media psych? What do you really want to know? And sometimes I see a person go off course where they've picked some variables and I see what their outcomes are going to be. And I think I've talked to them so many times. I don't think this is what they want to know. They're just confused. They're tired of doing it. They're pulling their hair out. They're just going to pick some variables, <laughs> you know, and I understand that. Like, I need to graduate. I'm running out of money. Um, but then I see it and I think, this is not what I thought their passion was. So then I try to talk to them again. Um, is this what you want to know? When you get these data back and you're staring at them, is this what you will have wanted to know? You know, um, will you know what to do with the data and, and, and stuff like that? So, um, you have to course correct a lot because you get into the chaos. And then you have to take a step back and go, wait, is this really where I was trying to go in the first place? Yeah, th those are good points. And I, I have to say, you know, in some sense, I think what Karen is talking about, different types of identification and wishful identification versus, you know, uh, whatever else. And I, But I also think that that is um, an indication of the state of the field the research and theoretical field, because when you're asking a new question, um, I just want to study identification. You know, let's say I'm just, start, you know, nobody had done it before. Maybe there's some earlier studies, but it's not really. But then as more researchers come in, then you're going to be able to see, well, it's not just identification. Now it's wishful identification. Now they're, so that also is a reflection of growth in uh, the research area. And, and I just want to say that I add something to, Rafa went through this as well. Uh, there is a certain stage where I have my students do split screen editing. Split screen. You have your lit review on top. And then as you have your other sections, and my instructions are, you cannot include any variable or any name such anything that appears here in the lower part that you did not describe here, right? And vice versa, right? Right. Don't write the whole intro. I, what, what, what's a shocking experience for your poor mentor is when they've read an entire uh, introduction, which they followed, 
now they're ready for your variables and you haven't mentioned them before oh my god what what exactly <laughs> these people were coming to the party <laughs> and it, and it's like you know it's as bad as when i used to say to uh my son in in uh in uh elementary school oh it's time for mommy school right he said oh no 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 that was like fate worse than than anything for him so this is now when i get to put my stamp and i say here's what you're gonna do you're gonna go to split screen and you're gonna double check because if there's something down here that you didn't mention up here okay we're in trouble if there's something up here and we've not done it here we're in trouble right and so it's that relational piece right that we need to um adhere to uh and just to keep you um to keep all of us in check because you know we're also human um and you know we forget uh when we have all these long drafts uh and you know it, it's just very hard to to keep track of all of it well plus maybe you've not learned that yet um i remember different parts of my evolution where i didn't know what certain things were or what have you and um you may not know yet that this is a story about your variables, the history of your variables and the theories that tie them together. And now I'm going to tell you that I'm going to play with these variables for you and something may happen. So you may not know that actually, because what it can seem like, I can totally understand this, what it can seem like is I'm just having a conversation about this general topic, but that's not what it is. It is a story about those variables and how they're related to each other. Um, so it's it's not that you could just have a conversation about all this and then jump to a different thing down here like oh my gosh you know where'd that come from you're so, only talking to us about your variables and you're not supposed to know that it's just like you were born knowing it in in your crib you knew that <laughs> you're not supposed to know that someone would actually have to to tell you because it could really seem like oh we're just having a conversation about all of this stuff no, it's it's not that it is more pointed than that. Yeah. And, and I just want to say one, one thing about this chaos thing, because it's near and dear to everybody's heart every time you start a new project. And, you know, I remember that um, the philosopher, um, you know, uh, Thomas Kuhn, who was a physicist, uh, wrote that famous book in the social science, I mean, I, I gravitated to the social sciences, which was the structure of scientific revolutions. And he was a graduate student teaching physics at the time. And it's a, one of those books that you can only write as a grad student, and then you become a professional and you kind of like, although he unfortunately spent all his life answering to this book. Um, but here's the thing, um, as he was teaching the physics, and he understood that what was in the textbooks, the way we tell the stories of science, that we actually think that it's linear. And we do that too, Karen. We've got a lit review, you state your problem, and here's your question, and here's your method, so it's linear. But what he noticed is that the actual practice of science was chaotic and messy, and that people didn't really know. It is only in retrospect that we add essentially uh, some kind of order and structure to a concept. And I think that that is, um, that applies to us as well. And, you know, so you've got to get in the sandbox and play and, you know, throw the sand everywhere and, and your creative process. And then the writing will be that sort of, how do you make, how do you turn something that is really, you know, uh, ongoing, um, sort of um, kind of just, you know, you're playing uh, and then turn it into a very linear presentation. And I think that that's where the chaos also comes in with the, the structuring. Yeah, you know, um, so you uh, quoted Thomas Q and I'm gonna to go to Alan Alda. <laughs> so I love Alan Alda. He has a bunch of science work that he does. He um, you yep. might notice at APA, he has a, um, a sort of speaker's training for, for scientists. He's helping scientists communicate their work to the public. And um, I've read a bunch of his books about this. And he says that scientific reports or science presentations can sometimes give the illusion that everything was so uh, predictable. Like, oh yes, I knew it would happen. I predicted it and it did. He said, for one thing, that's not interesting to your audience. Um, because they don't know all the all the wrong paths you took 
all the dark hallways you went down, all the things you got wrong. And that's, and they also then look at you as this, you know, how they like to say ivory tower scientists, like we knew it, we did it, you know, and that's not how it actually works. Um, things come in different orders. Like Regina said, it's not always step, step, step linear. So, I mean, in APA style, I guess there's not a ton of room for telling why you once thought this and then that, then you realize, oh, that we was wrong. But we don't really do we don't really do a lot uh, in terms of the creative process, which is involved in what we do as professionals in the social sciences and as psychologists. We don't really uh, talk about that. And I think that that's something that I think we as faculty should maybe uh, discuss uh, and see what we can do to sort of open up those channels of creativity and to give processes. I think, uh, Stacy, is that you? Uh, did you have your hand up? I don't think, did you want to ask a question? Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, that was my three-year-old, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Sorry no, about that, thank you, Regina. If he wants to ask a question, or she, we're totally he, fine Nothing with that. that you'd want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, well, we, we've come up uh, at the three o'clock hour and I, um, I really want to thank Rafa. I want to thank my colleagues for being here. You know, when Rafa mentioned that you should take advantage of all the things that we do, uh, one of the things that has changed, Rafa, since you've been at Fielding, is that we're also doing many more of these things online uh, and not just waiting for uh, actual clusters or sessions uh, and taking advantage throughout the term to kind of uh, create these opportunities for students to meet with outside scholars that they can present their work, uh, but also even with faculty. We have uh, uh, the faculty hour, I think every month or something like that. So I, uh, I really wanna thank you, Rafa. It's beautiful to see you. Uh, wanna thank everybody um, for being here. And um, you know, uh, until we see you next time, I think there's gonna be another, I don't know when the next one uh, is, but it'll probably be sometime in November. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Rafa. Happy Halloween. Great seeing you, Rafa. Bye everybody. Same bye. here, bye. Thank Thanks you, for Rafa. having me. Bye. bye. Thank you.